So we're doing a series on the fruit of the spirit. We are in teaching number 19. We started a good, well, that would be 19 weeks ago. So we started 19 weeks ago and we're just now getting into the actual fruit of the spirit. We're building up and trying to build a foundation up to the fruit of the spirit. For example, sin life, the flesh, and other things that can hinder the fruit of the spirit from coming forth in a person's life. So now we're finally in the fruit of the spirit and now of love. We're going to be doing love today. So if you have not heard any of those teachings, if you want to, those teachings are up there freely for anyone that wants to go up there and listen to them. Just be prayerful. Uh, if you hear something that you might not agree with, just pray about it and ask God to show you if it's true or not. We're going to look at love. And it's the first on the list of the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So love is the first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. And love is often seen as one of the most desirable qualities in the Bible. That's what we want to be able to love like Jesus. So we have to understand that it's not a, something that we can do on our own mind or our own will. It's by the power of the Spirit that works through us. The power of the Holy Spirit as we grow in the Lord that we have a heart like Jesus and it's a goal for us as Christians we're not just just lollygagging along and and hopefully one day God will cause us to be more like Jesus we have to put ourselves into it we need to get ourselves in the word and try to the best of our abilities to let our words and our actions and our whole being be like Jesus Christ. It's a work of the Spirit. It's a lifetime work. We're growing in the Lord. Amen. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in a person. There is nothing we can do by our own will or efforts. The fruit of the Spirit is an overflow of a life yielded to the Spirit of God. And we allow the fruit of the Spirit to come forth by willingly and sincerely walking with God. And not be a fair weather Christian. <laughs> when everything's all right, we love God. But when the going gets hard, we, we're questioning and raising our fist up at God. That's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to reverence God as who he is, knowing that he's not like us. He doesn't think like us. He doesn't act like us. We're trying to become more like him, not the other way around. We can't manipulate God because of how we feel or how much we shake our fists at him. We just have to allow the spirit of God to come forth by willingly and sincerely walking with the Lord. I want to talk briefly about God's love and human love. And here are a few dictionary definitions of human love. One dictionary says a strong affection for another rising out of family 
or personal ties. Another dictionary says a strong feeling of affection, especially for family and friends. And then still another dictionary says a strong feeling of affection, a great interest and pleasure in something. So God's love and human love are different from one another. There's a difference. God's love is unconditional and selfless. First John 4 19. We love him because he first loved us. God's love is not based on anything that we do or don't do. God's love is a free gift that is offered to all who will accept it. That is the key. We have to accept God's love. We as a person, as a Christian, say, for instance, in our family, we can't force God's love on whoever we're trying to minister to. We just have to mostly the biggest part of it is becoming a prayer person. Because if you don't know how to pray, you're going to get frustrated because you saying with your mouth and the person's not receiving, you think. But sometimes if you plant the seed the right way, that seed can be planted in the person's heart. And the right way is on a bed of prayer so you can continue to see with God's eyes and not get anxious and frustrated and angry because the person's not responding to what you're saying to them. Prayer is a is an important part of a, an important building block in your Christianity. A lot of people would probably want to believe that it's just a ministry that somebody else might have or that's not my ministry, that's, that's somebody else's ministry. I don't pray for people, I don't, I don't, that's not what I do. But God, that is how we communicate with God. That's how we learn who God is. And prayer is something that we have to learn, just like you had to learn how to ride a bicycle. You didn't just get on that bicycle and ride it unless you were an exceptional case. <laughs> we have to learn how to do these things. And the only way to learn how to pray is to practice praying. And that is one thing that the enemy does not want you to do. Try to pray. Try to pray more than 10 minutes and see and, and, and see if your eyelids don't get heavy. <laughs> Same with trying to read the Bible. Same with trying to do something spiritual. The enemy is going to try and stop you. So you stop you in your tracks so you cannot grow because he sees more in the spirit realm than I do or then you do. So it is following the road map of God and the road map of God is his word. Not necessarily these teachings that you might turn to on the Internet. I have to put that plug in there. Because that is how a lot of Christians, I feel, is my opinion now, that's why I feel a lot of Christians sometimes walk in confusion. Because, number one, they may not have a foundation in the Bible. And number two, they have such a smorgasbord or buffet of information on that internet is everywhere everybody wants to be a preacher it's a delicate situation your spirit is delicate especially if you're a babe in Christ and even if you are not a babe in Christ your spirit it belongs to God it doesn't belong to you the Bible says glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which 
are God's. Don't belong to us. We gave it to God when we came to him. So we have to leave it with God. So God's love is unconditional and selfless. And it's not based on anything we can do. And it's a free gift to all who will accept it. His love is given unrestricted and given freely without exceptions. And God wants us to love others the same way he loves us. That's the goal. That's what all this love teaching is about in a nutshell. Loving others the same way God loves us. But we have to get to know God. We have to get to know how God loves us. And get it in our spirit and get it in our hearts. But if we don't study, if we don't read the Bible, if we don't pray, that's being passive. And being passive thinking that if we do nothing, one day it's just going to happen. That's not how it works. We know that as adults. What we put into is what we are going to get out of. So God wants us to love others the same way he loves us selflessly, unconditionally, and committed to doing the best for others. Is that a hard task? There are a lot of things that get in the way of that. In contrast, human love is often conditional and based on feelings or personal gain. What can I get out of this? How am I going to gain? How am I going to profit? Conditional love is love based on certain conditions being met. Conditional love can be short-lived and changeable. And human love is sometimes not loyal and committed. That's the difference between human love and God's love. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. There's no middle ground for us. No matter how we try to make it work or how we try to compromise it, there is no middle ground. It says you will either hate the one and love the other or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And in this case, mammon means money. But you cannot serve God and some idol that you might have in your life. And we've done teachings on idols. And an idol can be anything that could take your attention from God. So we should not let our love for personal gain outweigh our love for God. So in summary, human love can be short-lived, conditional, and based on feelings or personal gain. I'm going to give you a few examples of uh, human love. Human love can be falling in and out of love with someone based on how they make us feel or how well they meet our needs. Human love, conditional love. Another example is showing love and respect towards someone only when they show love and care towards us. Conditional love. Being more affectionate towards someone when we are in a good mood 
or when we are around them, but less caring when we are in a bad mood or when we are not around them. People may show love and affection towards their family members because of their shared blood ties and history. However, their affection may fade if a family member does something to hurt or disappoint them. That is one battleground that is not talked about a lot, really, is the family battleground. Because there is a lot of things that go on in a family that we may excuse as love. And there's a lot of abuse that goes on in the name of love within families. People may feel affection towards their friends because they enjoy spending time with them and have shared interests and experiences. However, their affection may fade if the relationship becomes strained or the other person does something to hurt or disappoint them. So is that a friendship? That's not a friendship. That is a conditional friendship as long as you treat me right as long as you're doing good to me we're friends but don't make a mistake but as we said God's love is selfless unconditional and based on the nature of God himself one of the most well-known passages on love is first Corinthians Chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, is often called the love chapter. This passage defines God's love. Now I'm reading out of the King James Version of the Bible. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that word charity translates to love. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love I am nothing and I did a teaching on this a couple of weeks ago the the Holy Spirit gifts versus the fruit of the Spirit verse 3 and though I bestow all goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not love it profiteth me nothing love suffereth long and is kind love envieth not love vaunteth not itself is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own is not easily provoked thinketh no evil rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth now after reading that much how many think in their mind you don't have to raise your hand that God's got some work to do in you <laughs> should be everybody in this room I would say verse 7 beareth all things Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So these verses tell us that we can have all the gifts that we need. Gifts of the Spirit, the other gifts, we covered that in our last teaching. But if we don't have love, 
we have nothing. I don't care how many miracles, signs and wonders, and sometimes these are false signs and wonders and miracles. But no matter how many miracles your eyes see and they're not motivated by love, Paul's saying here in this chapter, it's nothing. It's sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Some of the gifts may seem impressive. They may seem impressive, but if not motivated by love, they're meaningless. And so as a Christian, we need to become seasoned enough to discern what am I looking at? Just because I see a bunch of people running around jumping, whooping and hollering, that doesn't mean it's God. Because if it doesn't touch my spirit, if it doesn't touch the place that God wants to touch in my life, it's nothing. It's nothing. And that's what we as the body of Christ need to be able to discern and be able to separate the wolves from the sheep. The wolves from the sheep. So 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7 tells us what love is and what love is not. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. And we can also see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, and in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. I'm not going to read those to you because I would like for you to look them up when you get a chance and get them in your spirit so you can connect everything that we're talking about here. And in those verses, it says God's love is is patient, kind, and not easily provoked. In the King James Version, it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. So God's love is patient, kind, and not easily provoked or prone to anger. God is willing to forgive us and to give us time to repent and turn back to him. How many of us. Somebody's done something to us. And you angry with that person. You'll never talk with them again. If they came to you. And, and wanted to repent and say they're sorry. You'd hold your head up. And turn your head away from them. So we can see the difference here. God is willing to forgive us. And to give us time to repent and turn back to him. You can also see that in Psalm 86, 5. And in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. God's love is kind and gracious and merciful towards us even when we don't deserve it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. In reading that and hearing that, we have our work cut out for us by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our spirit and soften us in the areas that we need softening in so we can start to reflect the fruit of love in our lives. That's the goal. To become more like Jesus, not become Jesus, but to become more like Jesus. An example of how love is patient and kind. I'm going to give you a couple examples. A person is in a relationship with someone who is going through a difficult time in their life. They offer support and encouragement and try understanding their partner's emotions and needs. 
They could easily become frustrated or impatient with their partner, but instead they choose to be patient and understanding. It takes a prayer life to be able to do that. That's the bottom line. It takes a prayer life and staying close to the word of God because your flesh is in opposition to the things of God. And the flesh does not want you to pray. It does not want you to get closer to God. It wants you to just continue to go to church and do what you've always done and live your life the way you want to live it and how you want to live it. That's what the flesh wants you to do. It doesn't want you to pray and seek God. Because if you do, you're going to change. That's how you're going to change. Is when you get a prayer life. And Jesus says in the closet. That doesn't mean a physical closet. Anybody can pray in front of everybody. Anybody can do that. But the prayer that God hears, he hears the prayers that you pray in front of everybody, yes. But he also hears the prayers that you just say in one word. I think David in Old Testament, at one day, he said a sentence or just one word and God heard him and granted what he said. So it's not how long you pray as per se. It is your heart that God wants. It is your heart that he's wanting to train by his spirit. So if you don't have a prayer life, then you're missing something. You're missing what God wants us to be in communication with him so he can communicate back with us. I'm not talking about listening for his voice now. I'm not talking about that. That's another way a lot of baby Christians and Christians that listen to different teachings, they're listening for God to talk to them in the spirit realm. I'm not saying God can't do it. I'm saying that you have to know what God's word is and that's how he speaks to you. God can speak to you through his word. Because in the spirit realm, there are other voices that can sound sweet and sound pretty like God. Why? Because it's the spirit realm. And you must understand the spirit realm before you start listening into the spirit realm to try and hear God. I've seen it happen over the course of my ministry is people get confused because they thought they heard God's voice in the aftermath it wasn't God so stay safe and this is God's voice speaking to you his word that's what his voice is his word and you can't go wrong. However, prayerfully read his word so that it can be interpreted by the Holy Spirit. An example, I gave you one example of, of how love is patient and love is kind. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 continues. It says, love envieth not. This is a biggie. Also, James chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and Romans 12, 15. Love, it says, envieth not. That means love is not envious. Love is not that big green monster. How many ever ever been confronted by the green monster? Jealousy. 
is raging in the body of Christ. Is raging. That's one of the reasons why the body of Christ can't walk in unity and one accord because of the green monster. And it's a real monster spiritually. Because it divides. And where jealousy is, love is absent. We can preach about it till the cows come home. We can talk about it. And we can say what the word says about it. But God wants us to show it. But we can't do it on our own. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. Love is not envious. Love does not feel jealousy or resentment towards others for what they have or achieved. Instead, love rejoices in the successes and blessings of others. For example, a friend who is genuinely happy for another friend who gets a promotion at work rather than feeling jealous or resentful. And it's secret because unless God's opened your eyes to see somebody in jealousy, that person is inside that person. Eventually, it might manifest in actions, and it did in David's case. It eventually ma manifested in his actions. And what I'm saying is a spiritual thing. It starts off as a little seed of jealousy. And if you don't recognize it, it will take root inside of you and cause you to be bitter and angry. There's a lot of things that go along with jealousy. We call them spirits. Envy can lead to bitterness, resentment. And even aggression. Why is that person so angry and mad at me? Why do they want to fight me? Love shows joy, happiness, and celebration. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 continues. Vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. You can also see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Also in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. In other words, love is not arrogant or rude. How many listening have found themselves to be arrogant, to feel arrogant or rude. How I many think they've ever been arrogant or rude? You, don't raise your hand now. <laughs> These scriptures are saying that's not love. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not seek to exalt oneself or put others down. Some may feel they have to put somebody down just so they can feel good about themselves. That's an insecurity that some human beings have. Love is characterized by humility, meekness, and a willingness to consider the needs and feelings of others. That's what Jesus did. The Bible does not show that Jesus went out looking to perform a miracle. The Bible says he was moved with compassion and the people sought Jesus out. They were drawn to him. Arrogance is characterized by an excessive sense of self-importance or pride. Arrogance can lead to behaviors such as boasting belittling others or disregarding their feelings how many have either belittled someone or been belittled maybe all of us in here and when you're belittled how do you feel when you're belittled 
These are times that your prayer life and your relationship with God become very important. Because during those times, there is a feeling of torment or a feeling of helplessness that you may feel. And you need to have God as your strength and your courage and your support. You need to have the goods inside of your spirit, the goods of prayer, the goods of the word of God inside of you to bolster you up and to shield you from that belittlement and that disrespect and that disregard for your feelings. Love is characterized by humility, a willingness to put others first. Human love is not. It's selfish. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care if it belittles you. As long as a person can express their anger in that way or express their disappointment in that way, they may be getting some out of it, but the person that's receiving on the other end has to know how to stand against it, has to know how to not let that get inside of them because it can affect your relationship with God. It can affect your relationship with that person. And if it happens to be your spouse, that's a real mountain right there because you're with them 24 7 so we have to have what's inside of us we need the spirit of god we can't do this what i'm talking about on our own on our own steam or our own will because over time it can break you down it can break you down so we must know how to stand in the spirit of God. Rudeness. Rudeness is a lack of respect or consideration for others. Rudeness can involve interrupting or talking over others or disregarding their feelings. Love, on the other hand, is kindness and a willingness to show respect and consideration towards others and where we can practice this is with our families with our children with our spouses with our cousins aunts uncles we're good to the people that we work with or that we see outside of our homes the true tests of the heart of God and walking in the heart of God is in your family is within the body of Christ, which we are family. We're the family of God. An example how God's love is not arrogant or rude. A person who has made many mistakes feels like they have let everyone down and are beyond forgiveness. However, God's love is not based on their performance or worthiness but rather on his character and commitment to them he does not love them because of what they do or cannot do but rather because of who he is and that's how we minister to say one of our family members that's having a hard time we can't put our foot on their neck and make them feel like they deserve what they're going through. My mama used to say, if you can't say nothing good, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> it's hard to hold that tongue in your mouth. The Bible says it's full of deadly poison. It cuts like a knife 
down in the parts that you can't see with your naked eye. And it takes some healing. But you can shield it. With your prayer life. And with words that come. Don't answer it with more belittlement. Don't answer belittlement with belittlement. That's the other test. That's the other growth that we must. We're growing in the Lord. It's a growth in the Lord. It's not just about coming to church. That's, that's just part of it. It's about growing in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 says, love doth not behave unseemly. It's shown also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 17. That means that love does not act in inappropriate or offensive ways is not rude or disrespectful in other words it doesn't just let it all hang out whatever wants to come out just comes out example of how love does not act unseemly a person is upset with a friend because they did not invite them to a party instead of behaving rudely or cutting off the relationship they express their feelings respectfully and in understanding recognizing that the friend may have had a good reason for not inviting them and that the friendship is important to them then first corinthians 13 5 says love seeketh not her own also shown in romans chapter 15 verse 2 and galatians chapter 5 verse 13 Love does not insist on getting its way. How many love to get their own way? They got to have their own way. I see some. I see some. Hits. <laughs> Is my way or the highway? There's no way you doing that. This this is it's going to be my way. There's no other way but mine. Love does not insist on getting its way. Love does not insist on having its way or getting its needs met at, the, at another's expense. Love seeks the best interests of others and puts the other's needs ahead of their own. How many feel that they have a lot of work to do? How many feel that they have a lot of work that God has to do inside of them? I know I do. God has a lot of work to do inside of us just when we think we're perfect and walking in perfect step with God. God says, don't get prideful now. Or he shows us. Example of how love does not insist on its own way. A husband or wife is willing to compromise and make sacrifices to meet their spouse's needs and desires. How can you have a harmonious marriage or a harmonious relationship by not thinking about yourself all the time? By thinking about the needs of your spouse rather than your own needs. That's how you have a harmonious marriage. That's a big start right there. That's how you can have a harmonious relationship with a friend. If you've got a friend, think, think about their needs. Think about what makes them feel good or have a good time or what they like to talk about. A friend is willing to put their friend's needs and interests ahead of their own. 
I don't know about any other marriage, but my spouse is my friend too. That word is used so freely and so inappropriately. That's my friend. First Corinthians 13, 5 continues. Love is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Also, first Peter 4, 8 and Philippians 4, 8. Love is not irritable or resentful is not irritable or resentful. Love is not easily provoked and does not think evil. One little word can provoke. And there you go with the think evil. We can't see somebody's thoughts. We can see expressions on their faces, though. <laughs> we can't see a family member's thoughts. We can't see what they're thinking. Even when they have a straight face, they could maybe thinking evil. But we just have to, there goes the prayer life again. Answering evil with evil is something we shouldn't do. We got to pray more and seek God's word more. A person in a relationship with someone who has wronged them somehow. They could easily entertain thoughts of revenge or hatred towards their partner but instead they choose to forgive and let go of any negative thoughts they recognize that harboring thoughts of evil will only lead to bitterness and resentment and they decide to extend grace and understanding instead and that is what will endure in the long run yes at the time you might feel revenge and hatred but in the long run, how is that going to affect your life? And how is it going to affect your relationship with your marriage or your family member? Family members go their own separate ways sometimes just over one incident. Have revenge in their hearts, hatred in their hearts over one in incident and can't let go. It can be a learned behavior. We may have seen our uncle, aunt, or mother, father be mad at the world and be talking about something somebody did to them 25 years ago and still have that hatred and that bitterness towards that person and not talking to that person after 25 years, 30 years. That is how destructive hatred and bitterness and revenge can be. It's a root. The Bible says, beware lest a root of bitterness springing up in you trouble you. And how does that root, how does any root start? It starts with a seed. And if we don't catch that seed, next thing we know is going to be a tree. And your whole character, your whole life is just going to be one big bitter episode. Because you can't find no love in your heart for nothing. Everything is bitterness. Everything is anger. Beware, lest a root of bitterness springing up in you trouble you. We can't see that little seed that's planted unless we know the word of God. Unless we know what to avoid. And that's how studying the word of God and connecting the dots, I call it in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit can get a hold of you. The Holy Spirit can 
touch you in a moment of quietness. Maybe when you're about to fall off to sleep, the Holy Spirit can say you need to forgive. You need to let that go. You need to give that thought to God. But if we want to hold on to it because it makes because we feel good, that's our security blanket. Then we will never show the love of God in our lives. We'll never show the love of God. So there are a lot of little areas that the enemy tries to sneak into your life and cause you not to be used of God like God wants to use you. And I think one of the biggest places that God wants to start to use a person is right in their own family. It's easy to talk to somebody about the Lord that you don't know. But to be able to minister to a family member, that's a project that has to be, and I was talking about prayer, has to be a foundation of prayer plus the love of God overshadowing your vessel so that God can be able to work through you and that person can feel that love from you, God's love. No, it's not all about somebody getting slain in the spirit or somebody getting healed or delivered. Those are all good things. I believe in them. But it's not our motivation. Love is our motivation. And if it's not, we got to get with God. If we're not motivated by love in our relationships with our, with our spouse, with our son or our daughter or our relatives, cousins, aunts, uncles, love's got to be the motivation. And if they don't want to love you, you're trying to give them God's love and they're not receiving it. Keep on praying and keep on loving. God will make a way. We just got to wait. God is not on our timetable. God doesn't think like human beings think. He doesn't get impatient, anxious and worried and worried. God's not like that. I am God. I change not. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's consistent. He's not conditional. He is unconditional. That's the kind of God I want to serve. I don't want to serve a human being that's, uh, that's conditional I don't want a human being to be my idol. You know that some people can have human beings as their idols. Do you know that's possible? They can have a human being as their idol. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pick up there next week. But all that was said to say that God is looking for us. To be changed and transformed to the image of Christ. Not become Christ. Not become Jesus. But to become more like Jesus. He's wanting to change how and transform us. And how we interact with others in the world around us. How we interact with, it, with our spouses, with our sons, our daughters, our grandmothers, grandfathers. Our family members, our church body, the body of Christ. And next week, I hope to look at loving others the way God loves us. That's what I've been talking about today. So it'll be a continuation of loving others. 
the way, God. Just ask God, God, will you soften my heart and will you show me how to love? Then you can fill in the blank. And if you are praying that in a heart of sincerity, you also pray at the same time, God, give me strength. Because you may have to walk through some things that's going to break down how you're used to acting. You see, we as grown adults, if you accepted Jesus later in your life, the Spirit of God's got a lot of work to do in you unless you yield to the Lord real quickly. He's got a lot of breaking down to do. But as you yield, he doesn't have to break you down as much because you're yielding to him. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord or faint when he is chastening you. Don't mistake it as the devil either. God has to teach us how to discern sometimes God from the devil. Just when we might think it's the devil working on our life, it could be God working. Amen. So God, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you will melt our hearts for you, O Lord. Melt the stony heart, Lord, and give us a heart of flesh according to your word. Anything that is in the way we take authority over you right now in the name of Jesus. We break your power over our minds, over our words, over our thoughts, over our actions in Jesus' name. We loose the spirit and love of God to transform us and change us to conform to what the spirit of God would have us to conform to in the name of Jesus Lord, plant your word deep in our hearts and bring forth fruit for your glory. Bring forth the fruit of the spirit in our lives, Lord, so that we may be used mightily of you, Lord, right in our very own family, God. We praise you, Lord, for you are a mighty God. You're able to do abundantly above our thoughts because your thoughts are not ours. Say this prayer, Father in heaven. Thank you for softening my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Be in my heart and be my personal savior. I repent, oh God, of anything that's been displeasing to you up to this point I'm asking you God to help me in my life Lord cause me to have a hunger for prayer and the word of God and the things of God in my life so that I may be available to be used by you, O oh God, in any way that you see fit. I love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.